On this episode of Brain Ponderings, it's my pleasure to talk with Chris Potter. He's an associate professor of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University. Um, he's an expert on insect brains and most recently mosquito brains, mm -hmm. the world's deadliest animal. And he can so he's going to focus on enlightening us on what's going on in the brains of these animals and you know why do they like us and why is it important for them to like us and then we'll go from how they sense us mm -hmm. you know where to go right. and then what's going on up in their brain so chris welcome yeah thanks thanks for having me on this is a this is a pleasure to be here and so why don't you start by giving some background on your your training. So you went to Berkeley as an undergraduate. Did you get interested in research then? I did. I was I was interested in research for pretty early on. So that was my first exposure. Um, when I was at Berkeley, it's really it was really hard to get research experience at that time. So mm -hmm. I pretty much took the phone book at that time and started looking through all the faculty. Um, and I got to B for Beckendorf, and he said, "Oh, we know we don't have any research space, but we do need someone to flip the flies, the fly stocks." And I'm like, "I'm there. I'm I'm up for it." So that's how I started was just being the fly flipper, the one who took care of the fly stocks. But then I kept asking questions um, to all the you know, the graduate students and the postdocs about like, "Hey, what are you doing? What are you working on?" Um, and they're like, "You know, this kid, he he's really interested in research," and so. You know, then they said, okay, well, you know, if you wanted to do a research project, they paired me up with the postdoc and no looking back from there. So I started my research um, looking at salivary gland morphogenesis in Drosophila. Um, that was got my, my exposure to Drosophila. And then from Berkeley, I uh, went to graduate school at Yale uh, University and the genetics department where I also did Drosophila work in Tian Shu's lab. And that was um, looking at cancer research, uh, yeah. but using the fly as a model, which is amazing I, that, you know, that was, what you can actually do is you can create little mutant pockets of like cancer cells on a fly. And those, these things will grow out like a tumor. Um, and I just thought that was just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So I, you know, it's, I studied that. Um, that. That is interesting. So the, the flies, the fruit flies are normally don't get cancer, right? They don't. They don't live long enough, really, to and get. So cancer. you manipulated some genes that yep. that kind of induce cells to start. Yeah, it's the same cancer. same genes we have in humans. So you can you can um, create what are called mitotic clones. You know, very similar to what would happen in cancer, where you create like a mutant patch of tissue that has lost, for example, a tumor suppressor, and so the cells just start to divide uncontrolled. And you can see this in on Drosophila tissues. Um, and I thought that was just amazing. I didn't know, you know, when I went into that, I was, when I started grad school, I was, you know, I wanted, I thought I would do mouse work. I would do something like that. But then when, when I went to this lab that was doing cancer research and flies, that, that got me hooked. And I thought that was so fascinating. Could, could you briefly talk about the, po the power of, of Drosophila and, and the genetics and, and why they're such valuable little organism to start? Yeah, sure, sure. So we've been working with Drosophila since 1910s. You know, in the beginning, it was just doing mutations and mutagenesis and collecting all sorts of mutant flies. And then in the 80s, um, it was the first time that we were able to do transgenics, you know, making, adding things to the fly. Um, and it's just been worked out so well that it's such a malleable organism um, you can add genes, you can take them out very easily. Um, and there's a whole bunch of genetic tools that have been developed over the last 40 years that it's to the point now that, you know, flies can be used almost, you can kind of think of them as like thought experiments. You know, I, I wonder what would happen if I did X, Y, and Z. And there's a way you can probably do that in a fly. You know, I wonder if I, what would happen if I, you know, silence this particular neuron while activating these other neurons, you know, how would that change the behavior of the fly? And there's probably a way you can figure that out in flies. So there's just so much genetic technology that are in flies now that you can pretty much do anything you want. And then, and also they, you know, use the flies to identify the functions of genes mm -hmm. for which previously the function hadn't been known. And right. then they like expose the radiation or some you know, mm -hmm. induce like these random mutations and mm -hmm. then 
you see some abnormality in the fly right. and you can figure out what right then you can work backwards and figure out like you know what what was the gene that was mutated that gave rise to like changes in you know uh, muscle cells or brain cells or whatever the case might be and a lot of times they're conserved um you know so the fly has i think it's what 60 percent, 70 percent of the genes that cause diseases in humans are conserved in flies yeah. um, so you can study them and apply much more easily figure out what their function is what their partners are you know who they're talking to the signal pathways they're in very quickly in a fly and then you can translate it into the human system so then you went from from the east coast to the west coast and right to stanford Right. Then I went to Stanford. So it's when I, um, at that point I had like a, I was making a choice. So I was trying to decide, you know, do I want to continue in cancer research or do I want to try something different? And, you know, I interviewed at a number of different labs for postdocs, cancer labs, then also neuroscience labs. Um, and I kind of, I was hooked on neuroscience at that point because it was just, you know, I felt like there were so many open questions to be addressed and it's just such an exciting field. And so I joined Leach and Lowe's lab at Stanford, um, and he was looking at the olfactory system in flies. Um, he's also working in, in mice now as well, but at the time it was mostly a fly lab. And I was, I just was fascinated by the olfactory system because there's so many interesting aspects to it. You know, there's the sense itself, you know, how the sense of smell works, as well as how the neurons find their right targets in the brain. Um, there's so many different parts of olfaction that are just so rich, you know, for research. And um, so I was hooked also on, on that. And so from Leachin's lab, um, that's where I really was, you know, got my first exposure to neuroscience and olfaction, um, you know, and it's kind of a love affair, I guess, ever since then. <laughs> I, I had in a previous episode of this podcast, I had Bob Data on. Uh -huh. and, yeah. and so, you know, he kind of went over the mammalian mm -hmm. mouse. And um, okay. So at Stanford, you're still working on Drosophila. And, you know, there have been all this pioneering work, you, know, you mentioned, since 1910. Right, right. Work at, and developing, you know, literally thousands of labs mm -hmm. working on Drosophila. Right. But other insects, <laughs> uh, right. the, gen the genetic, genetic tools, you know, they don't necessarily, you can't necessarily just jump from one right. organism to another. So, so you made some decision mm -hmm. and it was when you were like, got recruited to Hopkins or before? No, after actually. So after? Um, when I started at Hopkins, I was doing all Drosophila research, oh, okay. um, so studying um, olfaction in Drosophila. And it was about three or four years in that um, we had just developed this new genetic method in Drosophila. It's this uh, binary expression system called the Q system, um, and it's just, it's a way to essentially express things in in a in an insect. Um, and we, we were thinking the postdoc with me at the time, Lena Riabanina, and I were like, you know, let's what can we work, what can we do with this? Let's just think big. You know, let's think of some big things we can do. You know, and I'm very fortunate at Hopkins is that right across the street from my building is the School of Public Health and the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, oh. um, where they have, you know, strains of Anopheles mosquitoes. Oh. And so we thought, you know, why don't we, why don't we try to see if we can bring this genetic technology we've developed in Drosophila, let's see if we can bring it into mosquitoes, into the Anopheles mosquitoes. And so we reached out to them and, you know, they were very accommodating and said, you know, sure, let's, let's give this a try. They probably thought we were crazy, um, but let's give it a try. Um, and so, you know, they helped us get our first strain of mosquitoes and we did you know, injections and we made the lines and that, you know, it, it, this, this Q system, you know, that we pioneered in Drosophila that works beautifully well in mosquitoes as well. And so that, you know, we, once we did that, we're like, this is amazing because now there's so many questions we can address in mosquitoes. You know, we, that at that time, no one was really, you know, thinking of looking at mosquitoes in that way. Most of most, most of the mosquito research, you know, quite right, was looking at the, the viruses or the parasites that would infect the mosquito and the gut interaction, because they have to kind of pass through the gut of the mosquito. And so most mosquito research was focused on that. And, you know, we were like, well, you know, mosquitoes, they do have brains, you know, and they're just sensory organs, you know, so we're, we're really interested in figuring out how that works, you know, that they see them as a sensory organism that is navigating their world. Um, and so that's the, 
the approach we have taken. So how, you mentioned one species of mosquito, or, or one genus anyway, mm -hmm. um, the Nopheles. And so would, why, don't you, why don't you briefly talk about how many different species of mosquitoes are mm -hmm. there? You know, how many, right. how many carry disease and, and right. particularly human? Uh, sure. So there are about 3,500 species of mosquitoes on the planet. Um, and of those, only about like 6%, you know, about 200 carry diseases, um, you know, or, or bite humans, um, you know, and so of the 200, about a half of those, like 100 of those cause most of the diseases on this planet. And so there are three um, broad groups. So there's the Anopheles species of mosquitoes. Those are the ones that um, are, you know, are the most dangerous because they're the ones that are vectors for a plasmodium parasite that gives rise to malaria. And malaria, you know, kills more than 600,000 people every year. Um, so Anopheles mosquitoes really are the, the biggest killers. Um, <clears throat> there's the an Aedes species of mosquitoes, um, Aedes aegypti. Um, that's, uh, those ones are like the Zika virus. They can carry Zika virus or dengue or chikungunya viruses. Um, and then there's the Culex, um, group of mosquitoes. And those ones could be like West Nile viruses. Mm -hmm. um, there's another group that I think a lot of, there's this one called uh, Toxyrhynchines um, that's, that's called the elephant mosquito. Um, and this one is like the giantest mosquito. It's like an inch and a half. It's huge. Um, but that one, a lot of times people are very afraid of that one, but that one actually doesn't bite humans at all. It is, it doesn't bite. Um, and it actually, you know, it, as a larva, it actually eats other mosquito larva huh. so it's a very beneficial one and that's you know if you've ever seen jurassic park um and they have like the amber you know that mosquito trapped in amber uh -huh. um, that's this elephant mosquito that actually doesn't bite so <laughs> um it's it would not be able to get dinosaur dna out of out of that because it didn't actually do anything so it, it probably feeds on nectar from Yes. Flowers. Yeah. So it, you're right. So it feeds on like other like when it's a larva, it feeds on other larva. That's where it gets its like protein yeah. source. And then when it's an adult, it just feeds on nectar. Exactly. Yeah. And and so then, so in Maryland, uh, you know, which are the which species in Maryland carry disease? I mean, I know West Nile mm -hmm. has been around kind right. of sporadically. Right. So those are the Culex and Aedes um, species of mosquitoes in our area in Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of getting, no, this isn't off topic. What about climate change? I mean, this is going to have mm -hmm. a huge effect on the distribution of, you would think, yeah. uh, mosquitoes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think things are only going to get worse, to be honest, because of the, the climate change. Um, and so I think, you know, we're going to get to see more and more um, issues with mosquito-borne illnesses as the temperatures rise, you know, and the climate gets actually better for them. So, yeah, I think they're not going away anytime soon, unfortunately. <laughs> and it's um, it's only the females that. Get, can you talk about why why it's only the females that suck blood? Yeah. So the you're right, you're right, exactly. So only the females are the ones that bite. Um, so they require blood for the protein that's in our blood. Um, and they use that protein for egg development, you know, so a specific a specific protein, Chris? um it's it's a it's not a specific protein. Um, just protein in general, just protein in general. Okay. Um, yeah, better in our, it's kind of like think think of us as like a very high density you know snack bar in a way oh. that gets all the nutrients in a very small amount of like fluid. Um, so then that's so, um. We've have we talked about this? I, I, I can't remember all the podcasts I've done, but at some point we talked about what's called the mTOR pathway, which is it's activated. Or essentially, it's involved. It's activated by amino acids, right? Mm -hmm. Building blocks of protein. Right. So if you eat protein, they're broken down. Amino acid mm. levels go up in your blood. Activates mTOR. Is that is mTOR involved in the egg? I don't know, actually. I don't know if that's being looked at um, okay. you know, in terms of the blood meal. Probably, because, you know, they're getting such a large amount of protein in a, such a short amount of time. Um, you know, they do go into a refractory period after they've had a blood meal. You know, their abdomens distend, they get wider, and, and that, you know, triggers them to stop feeding. 
Um, and there were some experiments where you can kind of cut the ventral nerve cord of a mosquito so that signal doesn't go from the gut to the brain and they'll just keep feeding and feeding and feeding <laughs> until they pop. Um, you know, so that's the one signal, but there's another signal that they get um, that, you know, once they've started digesting the blood meal, um, there's, you know, it's like a neuropeptide that has, really hasn't been, dis really hasn't been worked out yet, but that essentially tells them, you know, they've eaten, they've had a blood meal and then they're not, they're refractory for, for a while, you know, they were not interested in host seeking after that. So there's an, there's an interesting, you know, interaction that happens after a, a blood meal. And my, my PhD thesis, I was studying a neuroendocrine system that controls molting in crabs. Mm -hmm. And anyway, the, these peptide hormones that regulate food intake, that food intake growth, mm -hmm. they're, they're not exactly the same as in humans, but there's a lot of homology, mm -hmm. you know, similarities in amino acid sequence. And so when you told me about the females, you know, kind of stopping eating after they get the blood meal for quite a while, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking of leptin, which is a, mm -hmm. a hormone when, when we eat, it's released into the blood, it goes to our brain. And right. Right. So, so I'm wondering if there's like some... I think that's, yeah, I think that there's probably something like that. Yeah. yeah. Leptin-like yeah. molecule. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it modulates free feeding. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. so then talk about the the different ways in which the mosquitoes sense a person. I mean, they have different sensory systems. Sure. Great. Like we do, so. Right. So the the long so the first um, longest distance um, sense is carbon dioxide. Um, so carbon dioxide is really the first trigger for them for host seeking. So you know carbon dioxide. Um, you know, the natural amount of carbon dioxide is about 0.04% in the atmosphere. Um, it's like 40, 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. Um, but in our breath, it's 100 times higher. You know, it's about 4% carbon dioxide. So, uh, and, they're, and they have olfactory neurons that are very sensitive to carbon dioxide. So what happens is that, you know, they're we're exhaling all the time, you know, it's, <laughs> if you're not, then you're not upright anymore, you know, so you're exhaling, that's essentially a signal that a mosquito uses that there is a respiring animal nearby, and they can pick up, you know, that uh, plume of carbon dioxide that you're giving off, um, and they can do this from a very long distance, you know, I think it's not exactly clear, you know, there's different reports about how far away that could be, but this could be easily like 100 feet or even more, you know, at a distance that gets them activated. So what carbon dioxide does is it gets them excited, gets them activated, meaning that they start to move around a lot more, and they start to search, you know, they start to go into a host search, um, because they know that there's an animal nearby. And then they start kind of flying, you know, looking for where, where is this animal? And that's when odors come in play, you know, then they're starting to pick up on the different odors that we're giving off. Um, all animals give off, including us. And so that's what they will clue in on and use that for navigating towards where we would be is just based on our, our odors that we are giving off. Um, and then when they get a little closer, so that's, you know, pretty much from very long distance to much, much closer. Um, you know, within about, uh, you know, once they get a you know, few inches from us, you know, then they can start picking up on um, uh, humidity and heat um, signatures, mm -hmm. you know, and then once they get very close, they can pick up on very uh, close range volatiles. And then once they touch us, then they can pick up on taste. Um, and they also, they also have a, you know, rudimentary vision as well. So they can still see us. So they kind of see, you know, objects in their environment, which helps to have, helps them navigate and fixate on a, a point in space. Um, but, you know, the, the biggest thing they really use is olfaction. Um, and that's, you know, what we look at in our lab is the sense of smell in mosquitoes, because it's so important to host seeking. It's so important to, you know, whatever, everything that a mosquito does, olfaction is playing some kind of role in that. And it's, it's, uh, okay, so describe kind of the neuroanatomy of the olfactory system. Sure. Yeah, so the mosquitoes um, have three olfactory organs. You know, we only have one, we just have a nose, but uh, mosquitoes have three, you know, noses, so to speak. So the main ones that you see are the antenna, the big, you know, the big things that are coming mm -hmm. off their heads. Those are the antenna, and that contains most of the olfactory neurons. Um, about... 1300 or so on 1300 olfactory neurons on either on both on either antenna 
Uh, and then they have these additional um, appendages called maxillary pulp um, that are kind of close to their mouth parts, you know, and they kind of come off the kind of the mouth part area. Um, and those contain um, the carbon dioxide sensing um, neurons as well as some other olfactory neurons. And then they have this, this uh, uh, the proboscis, the part that um, contains the needle, basically that will suck our blood. There's like a sheath around that contains olfactory neurons as well. Um, so they have these three olfactory organs that contain olfactory neurons. And those olfactory neurons essentially send their, um, their neurites, their, uh, their axons down, down these long appendages into the brain. Um, where olfactory information starts to get organized. Um, and the, the first center is called the antenna lobe. Um, this is essentially, interestingly, very similar and conceptually very similar to the way the mammalian olfactory system is organized, where you know all these olfactory neurons that are expressing the same olfactory receptor converge onto the same target called the glomerulus. Yeah. Um, same thing happens in the mammalian system. The same thing happens in the insect system as well. So, you know, they're not, you know, it's, it's thought then that this is perhaps like the best way to organize olfactory information into a brain, organizing it in these like little units called glomeruli. And, and so you're learning a lot about, I guess, you focus initially <laughs> on, on kind of these early steps in the mm -hmm. olfactory system, that, like, the, the the proteins in the membrane mm -hmm. that the odorant or CO2 right. binds to. Right. So uh, Bob Dad had talked about the olfactory receptors in our noses, mm -hmm. the nasal epithelium, and there, there was like Nobel Prize awarded for mm -hmm. kind of working out that, you know, there's several hundred at least of these mm -hmm receptors and they all have kind of a similar structure and they have these seven transmembrane domains and then the odor and binds on the outside and you get like the second messenger production mm -hmm. and then right uh but that's not it's that's not, not the same in the mosquito no no insects do it completely you know they use a totally different molecule for this um so in insects, they're ion channels, you know, so they're essentially a, an ion channel that is directly allows flows of cations in when an odor binds to it. And so the way that it works, there's, there's three groups of these ion channels in insects. The largest class are the odorant receptors. Um, and those ones contain like two subunits that come together to form an ion channel. And they're hetero heterotetramer. So it's like four things come together to form this really it was the cryo-EM structure was just figured out last year, two years ago. And it's this wild looking, you should look it up. It's amazing. Okay. It's, it's wild looking um, protein. It doesn't look like anything, you know, we've seen before. So, but it's, you know, if you huh. think about it, odor receptors are the most diverse um, kind of ion channel, you know, especially since there's so many insects on this planet. And, um, and they're, but, they're chemo receptors essentially. And, you know, that the earliest way single cell organisms mm -hmm. sense their environment is by, in that case, you know, it's soluble. Right, uh, right. Oh, do these odorants, ah. So, yeah, yeah, so um, these- you, so you know, in the mammals, there's this like nasal epithelium and the, the mm -hmm. odorant molecules have to dissolve kind of in right. the- Right. Is that the same in fly? It is, it is sort of the same. So the um, the olfactory neurons are housed in hairs, these hollow hairs, like the scintilla. And inside the scintilla, there is a lymph solution. You know, so they're they're bathed in a aqueous solution, the dendrites are. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the odorants will go through tiny little pores that are on the, the hairs to get into this lymph solution. And then it makes its way to the, the dendrites and the odor receptors. Um, mm -hmm. So, so those are the, the odor receptors are two components. There's one that's like a co-receptor and then there's one that will bind the odorant and those together form a functional subunit. Um, the most ancient of olfactory receptors are called inotropic receptors. You know, they're very, um, they're similar to glutamate receptors, interestingly. And it's thought that they might've evolved from, you know, an ancient glutamate receptor that no longer binds glutamate, but evolved to bind to acids and amines. And those are called inotropic receptors um, in, in insects. Um, 
and so those ones, uh, they're, you know, they look like a, they're very similar to like a glutamate receptor or four transmembrane um, structure. And, you know, those also look like they're probably, they're ion channels and they have two subunits that most likely come together to form like a functional inotropic receptor. And these, these are, when they open, sodium rushes in or do other ions move? Um, it's, it's to other ions. It's like a non-selective, but it's thought oh. that it's sodium, maybe even some calcium. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And okay, so then, but yeah. but the membrane depolarizes. The membrane depolarizes and you have spikes, yeah. Right. right. Okay, and then the signals propagate. And then you've, um, you, you had one nice paper on kind of characterizing the different Mm -hmm. ionotropic olfactory receptors. Right? right, right. We've looked at like where they're expressed and, you know, how they're signaling. And, at the, you know, we, we did some experiments to see, you know, if there was any overlap between like this family of over, over receptors and a family of inotropic receptors. Um, because, you know, the dogma at the time was that, you know, they're kind of kept apart, that they don't overlap expression. And we found that they actually do overlap in their expression, you know, so... Um, it suggests then that the insect olfactory systems, they might have the ability to express two different types of olfactory receptors on their same, same. neuron. Um, most of the time, most often they don't, but I think they have the ability to, if it's evolutionarily um, necessary or it helps them in some way. You know, you can kind of think of it as a backup system or it can allow them to respond to more complex odors in a maybe a better way, you know, that if there's, you know, one of well, receptors are binding a certain thing in this complex odor and the inotropic receptors are binding something else in that complex odor, when they're both activated, that neuron will now be much more strongly activated to a complex odor mixture than it would be to the individual odors. And so, you know, I think the insect systems have a lot of interesting aspects to them that I think, you know, they'll be using for mosquitoes and they use it to maybe makes it almost impossible to stop them from, from biting us. You know, they have all these backup systems in place. Yeah. And, um, okay. So what are there, is it known what the specific odor molecules are that are attracted? You mentioned CO2, mm -hmm. but beyond that, mm -hmm. is there something like right on our, that's released from our skin? Right, right. So there's, yeah, it's, it's like that's an active um, area of investigation is trying to figure out what makes human smell so wonderful to mosquitoes. And so um, there are a few things that um, people have started identifying. So there are um, the one class are these things called carboxylic acids. Um, these are these long chain um, uh, molecules that are, you know, acidic. Um, and they're likely, you know, kind of break down products of things that are on our skin. Um, and it was there was a report from Leslie Vossel's lab at Rockefeller where they were essentially doing like a round robin experiments to identify, you know, if you take skin from me and you compare it, you know, you then give it a choice, mosquitoes choice between skin from me or skin from another person, which which one, you know, odors do they like the better, you know, and then they would keep competing and they then would find that there was one group, you know, one person who was super attractive to mosquitoes and then other people who were less attractive. And then they also looked to see, you know, what, you know, what was enriched in these particular samples, you know, on the super attractive people. And they found that um, there was these carboxylic acids that were um, more enriched. So, um, you know, it's, so it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's um, suggests that, you know, carbox, carboxylic acids might increase your preference to mosquitoes. Um, it's not the only thing though. So, um, there's another group, uh, Lindy McBride's lab at Princeton. Um, they did a really interesting experiment where they essentially got the odor profiles off of humans and animals. You know, so they looked at the human, the odor profile coming off of, you know, human subjects and also like guinea pigs and dogs and all sorts of animals to, you know, ask, you know, what what is different between these two different samples? You know, what makes the human samples stand out from the animal samples? And they found interestingly that. Um, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of overlap basically between animals and humans and what, what changes are the concentrations or the amounts of certain odors in our samples. Um, and in their case, they were looking at more aldehydes. And so they found things like um, decanol and nonanol and things like that, that mm. seem to be enriched in the human samples versus the animal samples. 
Um, so I think, you know, there's not going to be any like one odorant um, that's in humans. And this is like the human odor. I think it's going to be a complex mixture of lots of little things that add up, you know, to the complex bouquet of a human. Uh, there could also be like natural odorants that are kind of repellent. So the mosquito, you know, gets close to a particular mm -hmm. individual and then it senses some. Right. Some yeah, I think, I think so there, there have been a couple studies, you know, that have suggested that there are like odorants that we might give off that are repellent and other studies have said, you know, they're not quite sure. So it's, I think that one's still up in the air. Um, I think I will say that every, every human is attractive to mosquitoes, uh, I think you can't get away from that. So every every single human is attractive to mosquitoes, and you know a lot of people will say, "Oh, you know, I never get, you know, I, I'm not attractive. I never get bitten." Um, you know, so I think there's there's two things to that. Yeah. You know, the first is that um, it could be that somebody you're with is more attractive, so they're <laughs> going to be the other person, or it could be that you're just lucky and you don't respond to the bites. Um, yeah. So you could be getting bitten, you know, like anybody else but you're just not getting the big welts or something so you just report you know oh i i never get bitten even though you were you weren't a tasty meal <laughs> I, I read in one of your review articles i think i think it was yeah in one of yours that it, it alcohol intake mm -hmm. and eating bananas right right <laughs> can increase attractiveness right yeah that'll increase your attractiveness exactly so i think it's thought you know it's thought that drinking alcohol, you tend to flush your skin, you know, get a little warmer and that'll increase the oh. volatility of the odors that are on your skin. Um, so that might oh, make you more attractive. And it's easier for them to get blood probably too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're a much better target. Bananas, oh. I don't know what's up with bananas, why that would <laughs> <laughs> make you more attractive, but yeah. And I, I'm wondering about metabolic state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we did all this work on intermittent fasting, you know, fasting effects on the brain. And has anyone looked to see whether a person is more or less attractive in the fasted versus fed state? And because we, we actually released, released some um, uh, acetone, essentially, mm -hmm. which is kind of when we mm -hmm. produce the ketone, we use release. Does acetone affect? Yeah, there there are attracted to acetone. You know, it is a oh, mildly okay. attractive. I don't think any much, not as far as I know. I don't think anyone's looked at that, like fasted versus, uh, you know, not fasted. That would be super interesting. I wouldn't be surprised um, if it did make a difference. Um, you know, it's like you know our physiology, physiology, and our, you know, how we're feeling and how we're, our state does change our odor. So it's it's very possible. Ah, uh, yeah, stress too. Stress, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. And and some of these odorants, I guess they can produ be produced by skin cells, but we also have a lot of bacteria on our skin. That's right, yeah, right. So, so our odor is, you know, it's a mixture of like things that we secrete directly, and then it's also the microbiota, the bacteria and the fungus and things like that that live on our skins all the time. You know, they're not dangerous. These microbiota yeah. are not dangerous to us, but they're there, and they will take our you know, things that we are secreting and change it. And so our odor, you know, human odor really is a mixture of the stuff that we're giving off as well as all the stuff that the bacteria and things like that are changing and giving off. Um, you know, and it's it's interesting that, you know, if you do like a soap, so you can clean yourself, you know, to some degree you can change your attractiveness, but not for very long. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these bacteria you know, live in your pores and it's pretty hard to get them off you. You know, you really, you know, it's, they're going to be there, you know, it's really hard to clean them off completely, you know, so you'll, you'll go back to smelling human again, pretty, pretty quickly. All right. And can you talk about uh, repellents, you know, things, chemicals to keep mm -hmm. the mosquitoes away? Sure. Yeah. So we've done a lot of, actually, that's one of the first things we started working on um, when we started looking at mosquitoes are repellents, you know, because Repellents are essentially odors. They're chemicals that are meant to keep mosquitoes away from us. And, you know, when we started, you know, we were, we thought, you know, what we're super interested in the olfactory system. You know, what aspect of the olfactory system can we look at? We thought repellents would be a great place to start. Um, and surprisingly, 
there's not too much known about how repellents work. Um, you know, so the ones you could go to like, you know, a drugstore and you get your insect or mosquito repellent. Um, they were identified because they had the activity of stopping bites, but not because we know exactly what they're doing to the, the sensory system of mosquito. Like, you know, for example, DEET was identified um, from the US Army, the USDA, you know, set up a screen in the 1940s. And this was because a lot of American soldiers were going overseas and just getting ravaged by malaria. You know, it was really destroying troops. And so, you know, the army realized they needed some protection against mosquito bites. Um, and so they set up a screen where they would take, they took, you know, this is back in the United States and Florida, they would take chemicals and put them on an arm yeah. and then wait for a certain amount of time, an hour, two hours, three hours, and then put this arm in a cage, you know, about, you know, two feet wide cage of two to 3,000 mosquitoes, 2,000, two to 3,000 80s mosquitoes. And they put the arm in there and then they would just wait and see how many bites did that person get with, with the chemical that was on them. And this um, was the, probably the privates and not the generals doing this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Volunteers, right? <laughs> All in the name of science. Um, and from that type of screen, that's where DEET came from. You know, it was found that there's this chemical you put on your skin and you wait three hours and you put your arm in this cage and you won't get bitten. And so that's, you know, where DEET was identified. Um, and DEET's like the gold standard. Um, but, you know, what DEET was doing was not very well worked out, surprisingly, you know, when we started our, you know, our research. And what we had done in Anopheles mosquitoes is that we had engineered, you know, mosquitoes that express G-CAMP in their olfactory neurons. So like the G-CAMP is like the calcium indicator. Yeah. Um, and so we can actually directly puff on an odor like DEET and see the olfactory neurons, how they're responding to these repellents, these repellent odors. Yeah. So when we did this with, with Anopheles mosquitoes, you know, much to our surprise, they were not activated by DEET. Um, Anopheles mosquitoes, you know, they were, it was not activating any olfactory neurons. Um, you know, so that was kind of un, unexpected. You know, we thought we were gonna find like a cluster of olfactory neurons that were activated. And this was like, you know, the key to how it was working. Um, and so what we, we realized is that, you know, when you put DEET on your skin, you have to use it at a pretty high concentration for it to be effective, usually about 30% concentration. So when you're putting it on your skin, you're mixing it with the odors that are on your skin. Um, and so when we mix DEET with an odor that would normally activate the olfactory neurons in mosquitoes, now no longer those odors that had mixed with the no longer activated the olfactory neurons in mosquitoes. Huh. Um, and so we did a number of experiments to figure out like how this was working. You know, one possibility was maybe it was working directly on the odor receptor itself. Maybe DEET would bind to the odor receptor and then turn them off so that they couldn't be activated. Um, and it didn't work that way. Um, so what it was, what it, what it appears to be doing is that when you mix, um, put DEET on your skin, it's essentially trapping the volatiles onto your skin. Um, so it's kind of hiding you from host seeking mosquitoes. You don't, you're not giving off as many of the attractive odors as you would normally would do. Um, Huh. So that's mm. you know, one of the things that DEET does for Anopheles mosquitoes. We've also looked at this for 80s mosquitoes, the ones that you might find in the backyard, you know, and Culex mosquitoes, what you might find in the United States. And those, interestingly, um, are repelled by DEET odors, you know, so they can actually smell DEET. Um, and so, you know, I... What I, what I tell everyone is that, you know, the Anopheles species of mosquitoes and the 80s and Culex Mosquito, mosquitoes, they diverged. Their last common ancestor was about 150 million years ago. So that's a very, very long time ago. Yeah. You know, humans and mice, you know, last divert, last common ancestor was around like 60 to 80 million years ago. You know, so 150 million years ago was a very long time for like their sensory systems to diverge. And so, you know, when. And are the, are the, so the, so you've got the, database right with the mm -hmm. the sequences of the genes encoding the different mm -hmm. olfactory receptors these right. ionotropic right. olfactory receptors right. in right. both the uh, anopheles and 80s right uh, and are there a lot of differences in 
There are a lot of differences. Yeah, oh. there's a lot of differences because oh. odorant receptors, they tend to diverge pretty rapidly, you know, so um, sometimes it can be hard mm. to find similar versions like the Anopheles odorant receptor one. It's very difficult to find that same thing in 80s, that same odorant receptor because they diverge so much, um, you know, because odorant receptors are among the most rapidly diverging, you know, because, you know, they're suiting the organism's needs, you know, so they can diverge that capture the odors that are important to that particular organism. Is there any way to block the receptors that are responsive to CO2? Um, so there, there have been some studies to look at that, yes. So there are some odors that can overactivate those CO2 receptors, um, and there's some odors that can inhibit them, um, you know, so that it kind of shuts them off. Um, so, you know, these experiments were done. So there, there actually, there's some really great experiments where um, in 80s aegypti mosquitoes, if you were to knock out the genes involved in carbon dioxide sensing, um, and so you'd essentially have a mosquito that can no longer sense carbon dioxide, um, the thinking was that, okay, that's it, you know, you've solved the problem, yeah. we're not going to host seek. Um, and much to our disappointment, they still host seek. Um, it's not as well. Um, but then they kind of engage the other olfactory systems, you know, to kind of find humans. You know, they might not be activated as much, but they're still going to find you eventually. They, they just have to get closer to you by their right, right, right. right. So it's like they have all these backup systems in place to, because I mean, if you think about it, right? So the female, the female mosquito, absolutely requires a blood meal in order to produce eggs, mm -hmm. and so this is such an important part of their lifestyle that they have so many redundancies in place to make sure that they will find a human host and blood feed. Um, so you get rid of one, ask, one, you know, if you get rid of carbon dioxide sensing, they have the other olfactory systems. You get one of those, get rid of like the odorant receptors. They still have the inotropic receptors and carbon dioxide sensing. And so, you know, you have all these redundancies that makes it pretty hard to stop them from, from host seeking. So the one way to do it is to use what's called spatial repellent. So these are odors that actually actively um, make makes you smell bad. Um, and so what we found for those, so there's a, a number of products. Um, there's one called oil of lemon eucalyptus. Um, it, has, it has a nice lemony odor to it. And this is something you'd usually find on your drugstore shelf. Um, and we've used that, we can puff that onto the mosquito. And sure enough, there are olfactory neurons that are directly activated by that, um, you know, suggesting that this odor for whatever reasons, smells bad to a mosquito, and that's they're trying to avoid it. Um, so, you know, what we're doing in the lab now is trying to identify what are the odorant receptors that are activated by these natural, you know, plant-based. Yeah. Because um, I think those are probably going to be the key to actually keeping mosquitoes away from us. Um, you know, we found that you know, mutating one aspect of the olfactory system, you know, they have redundancy will kick in place. But if you're actively doing something, you know, there's an odor that they can't. You know, they have to do something about it. Um, that will more likely keep them away from us. Um, uh, I was, we did some work on, you know, trying to understand, there's kind of this evolutionary theory. Uh, we kind of helped with this a little bit too. I wrote an article for Scientific American in 2015 and it's, it's essentially the, the idea that the chemicals in fruits and vegetables that are good for our health, from an evolutionary perspective, they're act actually insect antifeedants or natural pesticides. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're good for their, our health is they induce kind of a mild stress response in our cells, huh. adaptive stress response. And so I guess mosquitoes can't, well, they do feed on nectar. They do feed on nectar. Yeah. And can they do any? I mean, so they do some pollinating so they, as well. They, yeah. Does it make sense that plants might produce some um, mosquito, but they don't actually chew on? They don't. No, no. Uh, but, so I don't know exactly why you know there would be odors that they're trying to avoid. I think it's more like the plant defense, maybe. You know, if mosquitoes are there, it's disturbing other insects or something like that. I don't really know. But that the chemicals are good for us in fruits and vegetables. They they all pretty much uniformly have a bitter taste if you just put the pure chemical on your mm -hmm. your tongue. You know, so they have kind of this, and it kind of makes sense. We don't want it. There are some things that can, mm -hmm. right, 
hurt us in plants, you know, so we don't want it consume right. too much. So maybe there's some kind of co-evolution thing where it makes sense that plant would produce a natural mm -hmm. chemical right. that inhibits the mosquitoes right. from and right. yeah, interesting. Oh, I was gonna ask you, so you know, if you knock out the ability of the mosquitoes to send CO2, they can still get when they get close, they can still sense the odors. And is there any communication between individual mosquitoes? Mm -hmm. Like if, if one mosquito finds a person and starts feeding, mm -hmm. is, there any, right. is there any signals to others? I don't think, I don't think we've, anyone's looked at that aspect of it. Um, it's pot, so when, when there's a, um, Jeff Ravel's lab at University of Washington, he has found that mosquitoes can learn um, if there's like an aversive type of stimuli. So what they did is they kind of like shook the mosquitoes and they can learn that if they can smell the odor that was around them at that time. So the thinking is that, you know, if you do a, like a near miss, right, you try to hit them and you miss, um, oh. they might then be able to associate the odor of your body at that moment of the near miss and avoid you in the future. You know, so, you know, the olfactory systems, you know, that's one of the the amazing things about olfactory systems in all animals is that they're really good about associating what was happening, you know, with that odor to an event, right? You know, so if it's a negative event, an aversive event, they'll remember that that odor smell that they is something that they want to avoid. And so it's thought that maybe mosquitoes can also do the same thing that, you know, if they'd had a mere miss and they you know, almost got taken out, they'll remember the odor that they were around. Or maybe if you, you kill the mosquito, there's something released from the yeah. dead mosquito. <laughs> that would be super cool. We should take a look at that and see what the smell of death, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I think okay. that's, that's the amazing thing about the olfactory system is just how good it is at, you know, um, how flexible it is in, in figuring these things out. So associating, you know, things with odors. Yeah. Um, so, right, let's see, what else? Yeah, I, I have a list of things here, but, but I'm getting close to the end. Right, so what about, you know, so we, there's still people working on, you included, trying to identify, you know, repellents that are safe and effective. Mm -hmm. And what about genetic, genetically modifying the animals and mm -hmm. then turning them loose in the environment. Yeah, so I think that's really interesting, right? So there's a number of different approaches you can take. You know, so you there the one that's used right now is you can sterilize mosquitoes um, and then just release them in the millions. You know, and the idea is that the sterile mosquitoes, like males, for example, or you know, will go out and try to mate with females, and then nothing would happen. You know, so if you release enough of these sterile males you can reduce the population that way. And that is that is being used right now because it's they're not genetically modified. They're just, you know, sterilized usually with radiation or something like that. Um, I think the really interesting technology that's coming out now are making genetically modified mosquitoes. Um, there's this thing called gene drive. I don't know if you've looked, you know, talked about that before. But... I've, yeah, it's I've seen from the standpoint of the potential downsides of it yeah right yeah. yeah so yeah gene drive the way that works is using the crispr cas9 technology and you have a you know genetically engineered mosquito that um there's different ways to do it but one example is that you'd have a genetically engineered male mosquito it would mate with a female and then the only progeny you would get out based on how they set it up is only males for example yeah. you know so that you know you release this one um male it would then uh, mate with a female and then the, it would only give rise to males that can do it all over again. So it, it contains all the, you know, the tricks inside of it that that male, that is the progeny, the son that was born would go off and mate and then only males would get born and then just would keep going and keep going. And so what it could do is it could completely crash a population, you know, um, and since, you know, males don't bite, you're essentially releasing non-biting mosquitoes. And so, you know, it's it's an amazing technology because, you know, you could very rapidly just release a, you know, relatively small number of these genetically modified mosquitoes and they can completely crash like an entire, entire species of mosquitoes. Um, and so, 
you know, I think it's, you know, right now we're not, it's not being used yet. I think we're at the step where we're trying to think very carefully about it because it is such a, um, a powerful. Maybe you'd want to do that on some small island away yep. from any other land, right? And yep. so I think that's, it works right. on that small island and, and what happens to the ecosystem of the island. Right, right. Because I think, you know, that's, you know, the one thing, one thought is that, you know, the mosquitoes that cause the most problems, like these Anopheles mosquitoes, do we really need them on the planet? Um, you know, and it's, you know, it's hard to tell. You know, I think it's one of those things where we have to be careful. Um, you know, it could be that those are part of the ecosystem, you know, they might be eaten by fish and, you know, the larvae and things like that. So we don't really know what it means to... So they, they feed on nectar, but are they pollinators? Um, to, to a small degree, they can be pollinators. Yeah. Um, not to and, the same level as like bees, but they, you know, they can pollinate still. And they're, they're food for, for food bats for bird, or and birds and bats. Yep. chickens. Yep. We have chickens. Um, yep. Right, and we let them out in the yard and oh, stuff. Nice. And we, you know, we were thinking about from the standpoint of ticks and you mm, know Lyme disease right. and right. so on. And um, actually, ticks, ticks can spread disease too pretty yeah. well. Yeah, they can. Yeah, they're actually used to there be when I'm when we moved to the Baltimore area in the year two thousand, there was still available a Lyme disease vaccine. Hmm. And I got shots, and then nobody was getting the shots, so the company just quit oh. making it. And uh, but you know, it was that was approved. It was yeah. it was effective in clinical trials. Huh. There's not a, you know, in some instances, there's not a lot of incentive for companies mm -hmm. to make vaccines right. because you know it can be a, a one-time treatment, right? Right. The right. drug companies want drugs that you can keep. The yeah. person has to take it every day, you know, yep. yeah. for years and years <laughs> and years and years and years. Right. Um, okay. The gene drive stuff. Yeah, that'll be interesting. That's another issue, you know, the gain of function research on viruses genetically modified. Right. And right. And there's a lot, historically, there's a lot of bad things that have happened with. You know, the, you've seen the the film Cane Toads. The no, I haven't seen that. Oh, you got to see that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. It's from Australia. It's an old, old one. You uh, can probably find it on YouTube. And it's about when they introduced the cane toads into Australia to eat the worms that were um, the what what crop do they have? Any anyway, the worms were. I mean, so the cane toads, because they're poisonous, right? And so, right, they, yeah. right, right. Yeah, and uh, it's actually <laughs> really funny. It's really funny because the um, the drug cult, the drug culture down there. So actually, the these uh, there's hallucinogens in the in the what do they have? Kind of some some area on the toad here where there's high concentration of these hallucinogens. Oh. So they would like boil the toads and then, like, uh, anyway, yeah. I'd recommend yeah, it to any, think, anybody listening to this podcast. Right, no, I think, yeah, I think Australia has done some of those types of experiments. I think you can see how it didn't go as planned. Um, it's biocontrol, yeah. Okay, so to get to the end here, mm. talk about what's going on higher up in the brain. Somehow the animals have to make decisions. Right. Right, the, the decision, they sense the CO2, they sense the odor and, or the taste and, right. you know, somehow that has to be integrated right. into right. their motor systems, their, right. Right. the way they, right. you know, right. they're tracking their... Right, yeah, so so they're, um, I think that's the, one of the interesting things about the olfactory system is that the neurons in our nose, and this is the same for us too, is they directly connect into the brain. So the antenna lobe is in the olfactory bulb or in the brain. And so, you know, the one neuron that you have in our nose is connecting straight into your brain. And that's, there's no other sensory system that does it 
that way. Um, and so the same things happen in insects. And so um, once the, you know, the signals go into the antenna lobe, um, that's like the processing center with all these different glomeruli, um, there are output neurons called projection neurons. Um, so we're just like, you know, one synapse down. Um, and the, so the projection neurons, they connect to two, primarily two different regions in the insect brain. Um, there's this, the association um, learning center, which is the mushroom bodies. Um, that's essentially mm -hmm. where the center of the brain that re it really helps to associate, you know, learned behavior. And this other region of the brain called the lateral horn, um, which is the innate responsive center. So it's, it's thought that the lateral horn um, is analogous to like the amygdala in humans, ah. it's like innate, you know, kind of an emotional, uh, emotional responses, yeah. emotional yeah. response of the mosquito. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so non-learned type of responses. And so yeah. we did some work on this in Drosophila to see, you know, just how like, these different brain centers were organizing olfactory information. And it appears that um, it's organized based on um, like values that the odors are presenting. So, you know, the parts of the, the lateral horn part of the brain is organized into um, food type odors, you know, and also like pheromone type odors, you know, there's different sections that are kind of divvied out there. Um, we also found in my lab, like a part that's involved in like aversive odors. And so it seems like what happens is that the antenna lobe reorganizes the information into more biological relevance. And that is what gets conveyed into the lateral horn. Um, and so the lateral horn is now picking up on like how, you know, the signals of, okay, now I am smelling food odor, or now I'm smelling an aversive odor, or now I'm smelling, you know, a pheromone odor. It's organized that way. Um, and then you know, we're, we, we haven't really figured out what happens too much after that, because um, then information gets spread out again, you know, to actual making motor controls. Um, but it's this, so the, the region that makes the decision and flies, I guess, would be analogous mm -hmm. to prefrontal cortex and yeah, yeah. So yeah, that is more contributed. Yeah. So that one, you know, we really interestingly, even though we've been working on the fly brain, and now we actually have a, a connectome for the fly brain, um, we don't know where like the decisions come yet, um, you know, or what the trigger is. It seems you know there is different parts of the brain that are in involved in. You can kind of think of it like sort of like motivation or direction or motor control, and they seem to all work kind of in parallel at the same time. Um, so so in us, you know, we have the main excitatory neurotransmitter is glutamate, and it's like about 90% of the neurons in our brains right. use glutamate, and then there's the inhibitory GABA receptors, and they're distributed throughout the brain and act locally. Mm -hmm. The glutamatergic neurons are projection, and then in us, we have other neurotransmitter uh, expressing neurons that are few in number and located in kind of discrete regions, but they modify the ongoing activity of the glutamatergic neurons. Is there any kind of pharmacology kind of manipulation, you know, block this receptor, it blocks that behavior, that kind right. of... Right, so yeah, and so in insect brains, it's cholinergic, so they're mostly acetylcholine, um, that's oh. the excitatory neurons. Um, oh. The glutamatergic neurons are not used very much um, in insects, it's so it's the excitatory or acetylcholine, cholinergic, and the inhibitory are still GABAergic. Um, there are some histamer histaminergic neurons in the visual system, uh, but for the most part, most of the excitatory neurons in insects are, you know, acetylcholine, cholinergic neurons. Um, I think, you know, so that is one thing that we're really interested in getting into is um, neuromodulatory systems and, you know, how dopamine systems and serotonin and, you know, there's this one called octopamine, which is the fight or flight epinephrine type of molecule in mosquitoes to see how those are affecting um, behaviors in general and olfactory behaviors specifically. Because there's this one thing that happens in mosquitoes, you know, when they smell that carbon dioxide, like I mentioned, they go into this host seeking frenzy. Um, and it's not known, you know, what, how that works, you know, it's thought that it must be triggering some kind of neuromodulator that really activates them. Um, because it, it also works like as a gate, you know, meaning that, you know, once they smell carbon dioxide, odors that were, you know, minimally attractive now become super attractive to a mm. mosquito. 
So it's thought that perhaps like the antenna lobe now undergoes like a shift, um, you know, that once it smells carbon dioxide, there's some kind of neuromodulator that is activated um, that is no longer, you know, gates the antenna lobe signals. Um, and so we would, you know, we're really interested in figuring that out um, and how that might be working. How many total, how many neurons Altogether, you had a paper where you had somebody yeah. had somebody actually count neurons, right? We did, yeah. Um, so in um, in Anopheles mosquitoes, the ones we work on, there's around two hundred and twenty thousand neurons. Um, you know that, but it includes the eye. So if you think of just the the central brain, it's closer to about one hundred and twenty thousand neurons. Not not that many, I guess, <laughs> compared to the that, human. Not compared to us, but still. Yeah. And can you do you uh, do you uh, Mosquito people, do you do you use uh, optogenetics at all? We we can yes yeah we we're working on that <clears throat> getting it set up in our lab as well. Um, yeah, you know it's a little trickier just for some technical reasons because um, oh. it's like the you know for channel adoption you have to have um, uh, a factor you know that activates it you know the cystrastol, all trans retinol, um, and the fish food that we use to feed our our um, larva contains that kind of already in it. So, um, you know, it's harder to do the controls and things and they're a lot more sensitive to light. So, um, but yeah, you can get it to work. You know, that's what we're working towards is to get channel rhodopsin um, working in mosquitoes. Um, we, we use this red shifted version called Crimson. It's a red shifted channel rhodopsin. And the advantage of that is that that red light can penetrate cuticle very well. Oh, sure. And so yeah. you don't even have to do any additional manipulations to the insect, you can actually have neurons in the brain that are expressing crimson, this red shifted channel rhodopsin and activate them with red light directly. So you can have free, free moving animals then um, and activate their neuronal populations. Okay. Oh yeah, that's cool. So you can was... yeah, study effects on behavior. Mm -hmm. for, for the imaging where you're imaging the activity and mm -hmm. many, many neurons, you have to hold the mosquito in place somehow right we do yeah yeah so we're you know we're doing calcium imaging in the antenna so we kind of pin down the antenna so it doesn't move um you know we are interested in getting into the brain as well and doing calcium imaging for example of the antenna lobes um to see you know how those signals are being organized in the brain and in those cases you do have to do a head fixed uh, mosquito and you do have to cut the cuticle um, very carefully on the head, and you, can you, you also have to be careful not to sever the olfactory nerve. Yeah. Um, so these are like micro, micro dissections. Oh boy, you have to have steady hands. You have to have very, no coffee that morning. Yeah, exactly. I what my postdoc for briefly, I worked on snail brain. Actually, oh. they're bigger. They're they're bigger neurons though. But we actually used a a um, kind of a micro manipulator mm -hmm. device thing to do the. Rather yeah. than by hand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, Chris. Uh, I enjoyed talking with you and uh, people. You, you know, make sure you put your deed or other. Right. Well, what, what's the other? What What do you use? Do you use deed or um, something? I think yeah. I think if it's going to be pretty bad, deed it, it does work. Um, but I also try to use like oil of lemon eucalyptus and these actual like more odor repellents because that will keep them farther away from you so oil of lemon eucalyptus works pretty good and and um go outside and look around your yard and make sure you don't have any standing water exactly right where they, they can <laughs> that'll breeding lay, sites for legs and right <laughs> okay chris <laughs> all right thanks a lot this was this was fun yeah i enjoyed it okay. bye bye